stable now, that's what the experts say. They say a meltdown's possible, but it's safe enough to stay. Well, this kind of stability ain't safe enough for me. I'm gonna pack up all I can and move my family. No new blues, no new blues, no new news, no new news, no new blues, no new blues, no new news, no new news, it's time to choose, refuse to lose. I'd like to introduce you to Dan Hirsch. Dan is a lecturer on nuclear policy at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the former director of the program on nuclear policy there. He's also the president of Committee to Bridge the Gap, a nuclear policy organization. Dan? And when I first started doing no nuke stuff in 1977, Dan had been already doing it. That's when I met him back then. From the beginning of human life on this planet until December 2nd, 1942, all energy that we use came from the sun. And then beneath the soccer field stadium seats at the University of Chicago, we were able to tap the power of the atom. And that date, December 2nd, 1942, a day that will live in infamy, began the nuclear era. And just a few years later, that technology that was invented and used was then used to destroy first the city of Hiroshima and then the city of Nagasaki. In the case of Nagasaki, a bomb of the size with a plutonium sphere the size of a grapefruit <laughs> containing about six kilograms of plutonium was able to destroy that city in an instant. The amount of mass that was converted into energy was um, about a third of the mass of a penny. At Diablo Canyon, south of here, and at San Onofre, every year, each of those two plants produces enough plutonium for about 100 nuclear weapons. Year after year, every time you turn on the light switch and pay your bill to PG&E or Edison, you are contributing to the production of plutonium with a half-life of 24,000 years that can be used um, for destruction of cities in measure beyond anything you can conceive of. These reactors are dangerous for numerous reasons. They proliferate nuclear weapons. They produce high-level radioactive waste. They produce maybe 50 years of power, but 500,000 years of radioactive waste. They are targets for terrorists. A terrorist group aiming at a nuclear reactor has, in essence, an unofficial form of a nuclear weapon provided to them. Using conventional explosives, they can release a thousand times the long-lived radioactivity of the Hiroshima weapon. Each reactor at San Onofre, each reactor at Diablo Canyon has a thousand times the long-lived radioactivity of the Hiroshima bomb. Each of the spent fuel pools, the pools that store the uh, radioactive waste that's been taken out of the reactors, contains maybe ten times that much, ten Chernobyl's worth. If that radioactivity were released, you could wipe out most of uh, a substantial portion of California for generations. And the only thing that prevents that radioactive material from getting out is if the coolant keeps operating. And as we've seen at Fukushima, you can have an earthquake larger than they designed the reactor for, you can lose your cooling, your backup diesel generators can fail, and you can have a release of radioactivity on a scale that no one can really imagine. Let me give you a couple numbers. When a reactor is operating, it produces about, has about in, in it about 15 billion curies of ra radioactivity. We measure permissible concentrations in millionths of a millionth of a curie. 
There is enough radioactivity in just one of the San Onofre reactors that according to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, if there were a meltdown, it could produce 130,000 immediate deaths of the Hiroshima or Nagasaki type of acute radiation syndrome, 300,000 cancers, and 600,000 genetic effects, about a million casualties if one of those reactors has a release. And all that prevents that release is the constant cooling. And that requires human beings to behave appropriately. So let me tell you about the human beings who operate the reactors in this state. I came back uh, today from a meeting yesterday for the San Onofre nuclear reactors. And let me tell you a little history about those reactors for a moment. It's really quite extraordinary. It was revealed recently that for five years, the hourly fire watches were not conducted at San Onofre. The fire watch logs were fabricated. Instead of doing the hourly fire watches, they just recorded on the watch log that they had even though they hadn't. And San Onofre did not even discover that for five years. Why did they have to do hourly fire watches? Because for 30 years, they had failed to fix fire safety problems and had told the NRC, give us another year, give us another two years, and as a temporary measure, we'll do hourly fire watches, which in the end they didn't do. For four years, the batteries that were supposed to be attached to the backup diesel generators to cool the reactor in case you lose off-site power weren't appropriately connected for four years. A few weeks ago, it was discovered that the backup diesel generators had automatic shutoff devices that are triggered by vibration. And after being in their reactor for 30 years, someone finally asked, aren't there vibrations in earthquakes? If we have an earthquake that causes us to lose our off-site power and we need the backup diesels, the earthquake will shut down the very device that they need to prevent the meltdown. It's just absolutely extraordinary. And you should know a couple things about San Onofre. It is number one in the country for safety complaints. Last year, it was number one. The year before, it was number one. The year before that, it was number one. And that's because the NRC says there's a chilling environment, chilling atmosphere at the reactor in which the employees are too frightened to bring forth safety complaints. So the largest number of safety complaints to the NRC in the country, some years they are 10 times the national average. Why is that important? If workers cannot feel free to bring their complaints forward, safety problems get swept under the rug. And those safety problems can cause a meltdown that can take out a large part of the state. What about Diablo Canyon? Diablo Canyon, as you, many of you remember, uh, there was supposed to be a license hearing in 1969 or 70, and the local group wanted to put on evidence of an offshore earthquake fault. And the NRC, Atomic Energy Commission at the time, refused to allow it. And so they built the reactor. And a few years later, they discovered a massive offshore earthquake fault caused the Hosby fault. It caused them to have to retrofit the entire reactor. The cost increased tenfold, cost you pay for it. And then it was discovered that when they did the retrofit, they put all of the pipe supports and whip restraints in exactly the wrong locations because they had built the two reactors to mirror image blueprints of each other and had ended up putting the pipe supports and whip restraints in the places where they didn't belong because they were using the other reactors' blueprints. For four years recently, key parts of the emergency core cooling system of the Diablo Canyon reactors were disabled without PG&E ever figuring out that they would not work in the very emergency that they were needed for. David Brower, the environmentalist who spent so much of his life in this community, once defined a nuclear reactor as a complex technological device for locating earthquake faults in California. And that it is. Wherever we build one, we discover an earthquake fault more capable than the reactor it was designed to withstand. At San Onofre right now, there is an earthquake cluster, the earthquake fault cluster, which is estimated to produce 
ground movement larger than the reactor can withstand. At San Diablo, they've now discovered a shoreline fault, which appears capable of producing more ground motion than that reactor can withstand. So where do we stand at the moment in this crisis? San Onofre has been shut down since January. At the end of January, a steam generator tube burst, releasing radioactivity, causing an emergency shutdown. A day or so later, it was revealed that the other unit of San Onofre, which had been shut down for some weeks for inspection, had found hundreds of steam generator tubes that were worn, degraded. You've got to understand that these steam generators were put in one and two years ago. They're showing wear that you would not expect to see in a reactor that is decades older. Last night, it took uh, me an effort of almost pulling teeth to get Edison to admit that 12% of the steam generator tubes in Unit 2 and 9% of the steam generator tubes in Unit 3 have degraded in one and two years. And yet Edison wants to start those reactors up again and run them with thousands of tubes that have been damaged. The steam generator tubes are essential for safety. If they leak, highly radioactive water is put into the environment, and if they leak, you lose your primary coolant and have, can have a meltdown. So there is a crisis in this state. The Ablo Canyon is unsafe to operate. If there were an accident, you could lose much of the Central Valley agricultural area. If the wind is blowing this way, you could uh, all be affected where we are. San Onofre has eight and a half million people living within 50 miles. Eight and a half million people. And if they are permitted to restart, those people's lives will be in grave jeopardy. So what you're trying to do here today is very important. We can return to the safe, renewable, sustainable forms of energy that sustain life on this planet uh, for millennia until December 2nd of 1942. California, in many ways, is the Saudi Arabia of sun. And we not only can, but must make that transition. It is unclear that San Onofre will ever be able to restart, but if it can, it will not be able to run very long. The governor has the power to order the transition to the renewable forms of energy that we need. And that has to start now. Jerry Brown, when he was governor the first time, actually intervened to oppose the licensing of Diablo Canyon. But the Jerry Brown who's governor today seems to be running very far from the type of values that he tried to enunciate uh, in his first time as governor. But you can make a change, make that alter, move us to a system that doesn't rely either on fossil fuels that warm the planet or fissile fuels that proliferate nuclear weapons and create the potential for massive radioactive release. So, in closing, let me say that what we need to do is, if you'll pardon the expression, bridge the gap between these dangerous forms of energy and the safe and sustainable energy of the sun. And it has to start now. What happened at Fukushima, an earthquake larger than the reactor was designed for, could happen today at Diablo Canyon. It could happen today at San Onofre with its spent fuel pools. And so what you're trying to do is critical, not just here in Berkeley, but to create a statewide movement once again to move us away from the atom to the sun. And if we don't do that, it seems to me very difficult for us to be able to continue to survive as a species. We cannot have a world in which there are thousands of nuclear weapons and have them not used for long periods of time. At some point, they're gonna go off. And the only way to stop that in large measure is to stop the entire nuclear enterprise which proliferates those weapons. So thank you, recommit yourself, and help us find a way to bridge the gap between the dangers of fossil fuels and fissile fuels and that safe and sustainable world of solar energy. Thank you.